So welcome, it's great to see you. And it's a great pleasure opening this uh, seminar of the Center for Corporate and Commercial Law, uh, 3CL, on the issue of principles of corporate finance law, new developments. 3CL is very grateful for the support received by Trevor Smith. And this support that we receive allows us to run this seminar series. As you know, my name is Felix Stefek, and I'm speaking my capacity as director of the center. In this seminar, we will, we will present the new third edition of the book, Principles of Corporate Finance Law, published by Oxford University Press. And here it is. And it should be on every shelf of any good library in this and other countries. In addition to those in the room, I would also like to welcome our colleagues and friends from Singapore Management University. It's quite late already in Singapore. Um, and that's why I'm particularly happy that such a good crowd has assembled online to hear uh, with us uh, together on the new book. And um, it is another uh, successful event that we are organizing together. I could not be happier um, welcoming Professor Eilish Farron as speaker today. She con conceptualized uh, and wrote the first edition of this book. I still have the first edition of the book on my shelf. <laughs> Here it is, Eilish. And um, I looked into the preface. Um, and at the time, you wrote the following I have benefited considerably from the interest, enthusiasm, and insight of students taking the LLM corporate finance paper. And so, reading this, I thought it's very fitting that we are actually presenting the third edition in the presence of students taking the corporate finance law. Paper. Alish, I'm honored by and very grateful for your offer to join you in this new edition as co author. I could not have wished for a better colleague to work with. I'm also very happy um, to introduce Elizabeth Howell. Elizabeth Howell is assistant professor now based at the London School of Economics. But before she went to London, she actually taught corporate finance law here. Uh, at this university, and I had the great pleasure, Elizabeth, of co-teaching the course with you. Elizabeth, it's great to have you with us online, and um, it was an immense pl pleasure having you as co-author as well. Now, our idea for this seminar is that each of us presents uh, briefly on some new developments that we see in corporate finance law, um, and issues that are actually reflected in, in the new edition of the book. Professor Farron will begin, followed by me, and then Professor Howell. Altogether, I expect our presentations to not take longer than 30 minutes. And thereafter, we'd be very keen to hear from you, your comments, uh, questions, and thoughts on what we have presented. Eilish, may I now invite you to take the floor? So thank you, Felix. As one of those former LLM students, it was a great um, delight to me that you and Elizabeth agreed to join me on this edition. And I would like also to thank uh, Luke Chan Ho, who assisted with a previous edition. So I'm going to begin by highlighting four defining themes of the book as a whole, which I think have endured over all of the editions. Theme number one, a company limited by shares is a brilliant invention that can be used in countless ways to raise finance efficiently and to allocate and manage the financial risks that are inherent in entrepreneurship, innovation, and business growth. As such, the company limited by shares performs an important economic and societal role. Theme number two, the company limited by shares can function and through ingenious financial engineering, be used in ways that are not aligned with the public interest. Throughout the book, we highlight a variety of reasons why society has good reason to be concerned about corporate and capital market activities. Third theme, it falls to the legal system to establish the rules of the road that simultaneously facilitate the efficient and societally societally beneficial use and operation of the corporate form and curb the propensity for harm from corporate activities. Because a study of the law relating to corporate finance crosses subject matter boundaries, company law, capital markets regulation, insolvency law, 
contract law, equity, the law of tort, I could go on. Our book doesn't need to untangle the public versus private law distinction, but insights from that important theoretical debate inform our discussion. Our fourth thing, what does concern us deeply and is reflected throughout the book is the task of finding a workable balance between enabling and regulating requirements and the constant reflection that is needed to ensure that rules are and remain fit for the purpose of supporting healthy growth, investment, innovation, and thriving markets. Thus, throughout the book, we go beyond mere description to ask more probing questions about regulatory goals, regulatory gaps, and outdatedness, about who should make the rules and the form that they should take, and about the interaction between public authorities, market discipline, and self-regulatory bodies. It is with those themes in mind that I want to say a few words about the decision of the Supreme Court in BTI and Sequana, which is an important recent decision. The case involved disputed dividend payments and at the Supreme Court level focused on the content of directors' duties, specifically with regard to creditors' interests. In the words of Lord Reed, the case raises questions of considerable importance for company law. Lady Arden, the judicial doyen of company law over many decades, described it in her judgment as momentous. So unsurprisingly, we discuss the Supreme Court's decision and those of the lower courts at various points in the book. And in the few moments that I have here, I cannot do justice fully to a case of this significance, four reasoned judgments that are full of insights and a judgment that in total stretches to 160 pages. So here I'm going to be highly selective and just pick out a few of the key things that this judgment teaches us. First of all, consistent with the themes that I have outlined as being foundational to the book's approach, the Supreme Court confirms that the corporate form is supplied by the state, not as a privilege, but to encourage risk-taking as an essential part of commercial enterprise, quote, unquote, Lord Briggs. From the judgments, we can see that there's nothing fundamentally legally abhorrent about, quote, companies being formed for the purpose of undertaking a higher risk business than their owners would be prepared to contemplate if failure would leave them personally liable, unquote. Again, Lord Briggs. Throughout the judgments, we can see clear judicial awareness that even struggling companies need to be able to take risks. That this room for maneuver is an important part of a culture that prefers business rescue to business failure. Secondly, the Supreme Court has clearly decided that the legal protection of creditors through directors' duties, that is, over and above that which they negotiate for themselves contractually, is available. So the so-called rule in West Mercia is the rule of law that the Companies Act 2006, section 172, subsection 3, left room for. How significant is that finding? On the one hand, I believe Lady Arden is right to make the point that directors of financially distressed companies are already obliged to consider creditors' interests as part of their duty under Section 172, subsection 1 of the Companies Act to promote the success of the company for the benefit of its members. But recognizing that in addition, there is a creditor facing duty to consider and in certain circumstances, give priority to creditors' interests is important. It's helpful for reasons of transparency and effectiveness. But more than that, the duty to give priority to creditors' interests 
over shareholders' interests, or if you prefer, not to harm creditors' interests, may require something of directors that is different from that which is required of them under the section 172, subsection one, success duty. But that said, and while I agree that it is a momentous decision, its practical impact is likely to be quite limited. The recognition of this creditor facing duty is on terms that it will only operate in limited circumstances or extraordinary circumstances, as Lord, Lord Hodge put it. It's not engaged when there is simply a real risk of insolvency. The members of the Supreme Court demonstrating sophisticated understanding of business realities, many entrepreneurial companies will live in that state of being at risk of insolvency throughout most, if not all, of their existence. So for this duty to be engaged, the light at the end of the tunnel needs to be much dimmer than that. Not precisely determined by the Supreme Court, but a number of different formulations as to when that engagement will happen. A compelling characterization of the purpose of this creditor facing duty offered by Lady Arden is that it is to correct asymmetric governance, not properly reflecting shareholders and creditors' economic interests. I believe there is more to be unpacked from that, but that will be a discussion for another time. What I want to conclude with is just though a few broader reflections. While the creditor facing duty can apply to decisions by directors to pay lawful dividends, the late engagement of that duty means that in practical terms, it doesn't function as an effective control on the payment of excessive dividends by companies not imminently facing liquidation. I don't mean that in any way as a criticism of the Sequana judgment. I think it's right for the senior judiciary to be cautious, to be mindful of the dangers of judicial lawmaking that could inadvertently make business too risk averse or undermine a risk oriented culture. The choice between high payouts to shareholders and investment in long term sustainable growth are, is a commercial one that the courts are not well placed to adjudicate after the event and with the benefit of hindsight. But what does trouble me is the failure of the legislature to tackle the problem of excessive dividends. And this is in spite of several parliamentary inquiries after the notorious collapse of some companies in the middle of the last decade. In the aftermath of those collapses, the government was proposing a range of measures, even including at one point, a two year forward looking director solvency statement with res respect to capacity to pay dividends. Fast forward to today. Now, we're not even getting the modest transparency improvement of an annual distributable profits figure stated in the annual accounts. We didn't even get to the point of having draft regulations proposed that would have enacted at least that. But those draft regulations were withdrawn just a couple of weeks ago. The government telling us instead, it was working on quotes, options to reduce the burden of red tape to ensure the UK is one of the best places in the world to do business. So I find it baffling that in 2018, the government could feel that there was a need to act because the UK's dividend regime was seen as complex, potentially too backward looking, insufficient weight placed on current profitability, future prospects, and hence providing only limited protection to creditors, into today saying that actually what we need to do in this area is promote international competitiveness. That's really quite a U-turn turn, and one that I do not find encouraging. Thank you. Many thanks, Eilish. Um, I will now present three developments in debt finance law reflected in the new edition 
of the corporate um, of the principles of corporate finance law book. The first issue that I would like to uh, present um, are the perspectives that we employ to analyze, uh, make, and apply corporate debt finance law. In particular, the new edition of the book contains a section asking why we need corporate debt finance law. The answer provided is based on established principles of economic contract theory. Debt finance law, as chap chapter 11 argues, is necessary as and when the parties involved struggle to find optimal solutions by way of contract. There are at least three perspectives on why those negotiating debt finance contracts, in particular the borrowing company and the lenders, fail to reach optimal solutions. First, transaction costs may stand in the way of optimal debt finance contracts. Transaction costs include the cost of gathering information, making decisions, negotiating with counterparties, coordinating with other stakeholders, monitoring the contracts executed, adjusting debt contracts ex post, finding solutions in case of conflict, and enforcing loans individually or collectively. It is rational for borrowers and lenders not to agree to a debt financing transaction if the transaction costs involved exceed the profit to be made. Second, asymmetric information and interests can lead to situations in which those in control take decisions that harm the interests of those affected. <laughs> lenders, for example, may fear that after they have agreed to provide debt finance, directors and shareholders will take hidden actions that lower the lender's expected income from the debt investment. As a result, lenders, directors, and shareholders may engage in costly activity to avoid such action. For example, they might agree on clauses that restrict the freedom of the borrowing company, however, thereby creating opportunity costs, as the company will now be unable to realize some valuable projects. Third, Debt finance documents, even with an ever-growing length, will never achieve the aim to contain all rights and obligations of the parties involved for all developments that may occur in the future. Such incompleteness of loan contracts is evidenced by the fact that parties at times amend such contracts without a breach of, financial, of a financial covenant or an event of financial distress. However, Practice also shows that the parties often fail to complete their incomplete contracts when later change occurs. Against the background of these three perspectives on debt market failure, debt finance law, as opposed to debt finance contracts, can be conceptualized to achieve three aims. Minimize transaction costs, solve problems of asymmetric information and interests, and complete incomplete contracts. Which of these three perspectives is most useful depends on the question at hand. A unifying purpose of debt finance law can be identified in minimizing the cost of capital or cost of finance. Cost of capital is the cost a business incurs to obtain the finance needed to fund its operations, i.e. the creation of products and services. The cost of capital is influenced by the expected income of those providing capital. For example, a debt investor will charge a higher interest rate if there is a higher risk of default of the borrower, which lowers the expected income from the debt investment. However, the expected income of capital investors is also impacted upon by transaction costs, a symmetry of interest and information, and incomplete contracts. By minimizing the costs associated with these three types of market failures, debt finance law contributes to lowering the cost of capital. Those making debt finance law, in particular parliaments, governments, and courts, should however keep in mind that the aim is to minimize the cost of capital and not to minimize the cost of debt finance. Minimizing the cost of debt finance by inefficiently preferring the interests of debt investors over the interests of equity investors would decrease the cost of debt finance 
while at the same time increasing the combined cost of debt and equity finance, i.e. the cost of capital. The law of debt finance can therefore also be understood as an attempt to strike the right balance between the interests of debt and equity investors, as well as the productive interests of the business. Now, I would like to present two more specific and more tangible new developments reflected in the book, new providers of debt finance and unitronch loans. In more recent times, new providers of debt finance have entered the market. Among them are hedge funds, pension funds, insurance companies, investment funds, private equity houses, and individuals lending on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. Previously referred to as shadow banks, such lending is now referred to as non-bank financial intermediation. In particular, private credit funds provide an ever-increasing part of the debt finance issued in the United Kingdom. This matters as they are subject to incentives different from those incentives that banks are, uh, are driven by, concerning, for example, the regulatory cost of capital, the investment mandate, the approach to publicity, and the decision-making as regards distressed debt. A particular type of debt finance such new providers offer are unitrange loans. Unitrange facilities have become more popular in the last decade as an alternative to syndicated loan contracts and complex lending structures. A unitrange facility is a term loan consisting of a single tranche and documented in a single loan agreement with a blended senior junior interest rate. Unitranche loans have sizes between 10 million pounds and 4 billion pounds and are not provided by banks but other lenders, such as private debt funds and alternative credit providers. A unitranche loan is often combined with a revolving credit facility provided by a bank. Hence, hence the unitranche loan provides the structural debt finance, while the revolving loan provides the working capital for the company. The revolving credit facility is usually senior to the unitranche loan and documented in the same agreement. The unitranche loan is usually secured with a package of real security and guarantees similar to those of a traditional bank loan. From the borrower's perspective, unitranche facilities are often more flexible than traditional loans in terms of covenants, and can be tailored more flexibly to the individual finance needs. As there is only one lender, or only a small group of lenders, and one loan document, the transaction can be negotiated more easily and quicker compared to the process of loan syndication. This applies also for renegotiation ex post. So as a result, however, interest margins of unitranche loans tend to be higher than those of traditional debt financing. The borrower is also often locked into this relatively expensive financing for some time as the lenders need to manage their refinancing risk. If multiple lenders are involved, the borrower is usually not a party to their arrangements between each other. Unitranche loan lenders employ agreements among lenders, AALs, which unlike intercreditor agreements usually do not include the borrower as a party. Unitranche loans may differentiate between first out and last out lenders, with the effect that in the financial distress of the borrower, the first out lender is paid first and the last out lender only afterwards. This mirrors to some degree the priority and waterfall clauses employed in intercreditor agreements, however, within the context of the single tranche of the unitranche loan. The agreement among lenders is used to differentiate the position of multiple investors in a unitranche financing. Such differentiation facilitates financings in which the unit tranche loan is provided by a single debt fund, which only sells participations to other investors later. Now, these were selected and very brief examples of new issues covered in the book. And I'm now handing over to Professor Howell to speak on capital markets law. Many thanks, Eilish and Felix. I'm going to just um, share my screen uh, to pull up a, a few slides that I've prepared. Uh, so uh, my chapters um, focus on the area of capital markets finance, other than the chapter on corporate bonds, which was uh, Felix's area. Um, 
and this area um has been a uh a, a, a it, there's been a huge amount of a uh, reform in this area very much in the uk government driven and we've seen a continual stream of uh, discussion papers consultations proposals including but not limited to a uh, reviews of the listing regime overhauling the prospectus regime and so on and this all weaves into uh, highly salient questions around the crisis uh, uh, in the UK public markets and the, and the role of regulation in that regard. So my chapters uh, in the book just try to offer a snapshot as far as possible of what um, felt like a very fast moving target when I was working on this. And that's viewed within the broader post-Brexit landscape. Um, the law, um, is stated as the start of this year, but where possible, I sought to to weave in later changes as there's been considerable movement even since the start of the year. Um, what I'd like to think about with my short talk is uh, the sort of international arena and questions about market access for uh, issuers, for companies. And when we think about the context for the UK, its share of global IPOs of initial public offers has been declining rapidly. So in 2006, you see the stats on the slide, um, we had about 10% of the share and that's dropped to 5% as of 2018. There's also been concerns about the comparative lack of tech IPOs. And this is all fed into the flurry of, of recent reviews. So, um, a lot of it has been triggered by the the uh, the Hill review, um, which talked about softening the regime for dual class shares. There's been the prospectus uh, framework overhaul, which is uh, again ongoing, and there's been the introduction of this competitiveness objective for the regulator, and that came in through the legislative re reforms, uh, FISMA 2023. And uh, there's there's an under underlying driver about. Um, improving the UK's international competitiveness. But again, we, we run up against that ever-present tension of balancing a, that notion of competitiveness with ensuring a sufficient and effective investor protection. Um, when we think about, well, what do we mean then about internationalization in this area? We're, we're really just very simply looking at an issuer accessing finance, a outside its home jurisdiction, so accessing capital internationally. And there's a, a range of conceptual approaches that jurisdictions can use to tackle the question of cross-border access to their capital markets. So terminology includes concepts such as equivalence, mutual recognition, the US language of substitute compliance, private placement exemptions, and so on. And jurisdictions will adopt different techniques to tackle international offers and they can thereby facilitate more or, or less access to their markets. And then sort of rooting this in the Brexit context, we, we're raised, we, we face the question of, well, how will the UK and the EU tackle this in light of Brexit? How will they manage market access after Brexit? So if we start with the EU, a equivalence is the concept that the EU uses to access whether it's third countries, regulatory, super, regulatory and supervisory systems are, are equivalent to, to the EU's. Um, so so, so a, within the prospectus regulation, the EU prospectus regulation, we have an equivalence system under Article 29. Um, and what this enables is you can have a, a member state regulator, a, a, an EU member state regulator approving a prospectus of a third country issuer where it's drawn up in accordance with the national laws of the third country, provided those third country rules are equivalent to the prospectus regulation. So what we see is that the, the, the prospectus must be both Re reviewed and approved by that regulator. So there's this um, assessment process. In addition, cooperation arrangements must also be in place between the two regulators regarding exchange of information mm -hmm. and so on. Now, um, as becomes clear from that discussion there, that is a cumbersome system, very cumbersome, and it's never been used. There is an alternative in the prospectus regulation under Article 28. So you can drop a prospectus directly in accordance with the prospectus regulation. So simply follow EU law. 
And the ESMA data I mentioned here is just reiterating these points. So we've had no equivalence decisions taken under Article 29. All uh, third country prospectuses that are approved use Article 28. But really in practice, what happens is companies tend to use yes. private placement exemptions. So they'll simply target qualified, sophisticated investors. We, sh we should note, though, this is a, an area um, that's evolving. So there are proposed revisions uh, to the EU regime. So the Commission's thinking about expanding the equivalence criteria, so making it more granular, but they're also talking about replacing approval with simple filing, so a, a lightening uh, there. Um, but the Commission also says it, it, it anticipates limited appetite for, for, for that and really envisages the continued use of Article 28 where prospectuses are being approved. Let's turn to the UK then. So, first of all, this sort of status quo is that if you've got an overseas a issuer coming to the UK, they must currently comply with the prospectus regulation that's been onshored in the UK. So that's the regime we've just been talking about, Article 28 and 29. But as part of the overhaul of the prospectus regime that I mentioned at the outset, the government wants to make it easier for overseas issuers to access the UK markets via full public offer. Why? Well, as, as we've seen, Article 28 is rarely used, Article 29 is never used. There's, again, this, this need for this assessment and approval process. And in practice, third country issuers are using private placements. But uh, the thinking by the government's view is that public um, full public offers um, could start to occur if... Um, if there are such reforms, and that could include a retail element. So the government thought about three options. So in, as the book was evolving in the earlier drafts, it, as the prospectus consultation came out, the three options they, 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 um, they talked about were, first of all, the status quo. So we just keep the system as it is, the, the, the approach we talked about, Article 28 and 29. Secondly, you could have no full public offers from international issuers. And then thirdly, which is the direction of travel, is this notion of regulatory deference. So what the what, what they're suggesting is that an offering could be extended into the UK on the basis of offering documents prepared in accordance with the rules of the relevant overseas jurisdiction. So what would happen is you get a, an overall country assessment by uh, the Treasury. Uh, with advice from the regulator, but there would be no regulatory review or approval of the prospectus. And, and they're taking a more sort of big picture view to investor protection. So more looking at it more on a holistic basis. So perhaps thinking also about ongoing disclosure requirements. Again, coming back to the balancing of competitiveness with investor protection, the suggestion is that there's going to be an intervention power for the regulator uh, to protect investors in exceptional circumstances. So, so, so what we're seeing is 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 a, a vision of high level equivalence by the UK, the the assessment of a country by the Treasury. Uh, no line by line equivalence of the prospectus, but a more holistic approach to investor protection. But there's the intervention power in the sort of back pocket of the regulator to close down an offer where there's a problem. Now, I'd, I'd say that the, the Treasury is still thinking about this regime. The, when the near final statutory instrument came out on the prospectus regime in July this year, um, the details on, on the regulatory deference uh, system were not included, but 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 the, the the sense of as I say the direction of travel seems to be envisaging a liberal system, uh, looking more at outcomes and and whether they're similar and very much embracing deference to the home regulator. So we can then compare that with the EU regime where we've got also an equivalence model being used, but one which is currently much tougher. And, and more broadly, we can get a sense that there is a political undercurrent to this highly technical area of capital markets regulation. So thank you very much. I'll stop there on my discussion just now. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. So now it's time for comments, uh, questions, uh, thoughts.